One thing I think it, I want to start by asking the question, questions. That I, I literally have two questions, and then we'll open it up to a larger discussion because I, I think it's. I think you guys have a lot to say on this. But um, one is um, uh, how do we rate? If you had to, to sort of pick um, one waypoint, maybe two, maybe two, Bill, uh, um, that, that you see as, as turning points in what is said about role playing games, what are those from your One of the places that I would go to, uh, maybe two points, is the Dungeons and Dragons conversation changed. Yep. If we're looking at discourse and historiography, Um, 
And for me, you know, I dearly hope that her book, Rise of the Video Games Monsters, changed or changes or continues to change, or for goodness sake, let's change um, the way we talk about games. Um, yeah, it, it's good stuff. Um, very briefly, uh, if I may, what she says is that, um, you know, you draw a picture to understand or communicate about what a thing looks like. You write a poem to understand or communicate what a thing feels like, what, what a feeling. And you design a game to illustrate or understand a dynamic system. Um, and so her call to action is that we should, like, if you go to the RMB, you can design a game about that experience in order to better understand and better communicate the, uh, the system and the action of the RMB. Everyone. Um, Boy, boy, I like to change the way I think about games. Boy, it changes the way I think about talks about it. I don't have to do two. Yeah. <laughs> I could want to. Ross and Yoke are still, still on the bed. Okay. Well, I can give you my finger, like finger on the pulse, pulse kind of feeling, because due to my interest in career treachery, I've remained at a near college um, campuses for pretty much my entire adult professional life until now. So as I kind of age, the people around me who were like playing, talking about games, kind of stayed relatively constant. So it's really hard to know a specific point because on some level you can kind of see that this exponential curve that goes now and now to the point where like Fiasco has, is now featured on a YouTube on a YouTube show that has like like half a million viewers. But like I feel like there's this constant like there has been this constant growth where like first for like that kind of is systematic and not unrelated to other social trends, like the relative untalks, like the relative level to which like subjects like working games were untalked about to the part two or changes in that like the edition is like huge, but like every time there's a new thing, like it or not, because of the interesting tribal nature of which it came about, and the new thing kind of became like this was kind of like hated about it, and then it became kind of accepted. So there's this probably stages like like hatred, tribalism, territorialism, and acceptance. And I feel like Forge, when I was in college, was like the hated thing, and so it became accepted, and now like Apocalypse World is like played everywhere. Um, we saw some, we might have seen something similar happen in the LARP world. Like, I, like I've been LARPing for since maybe 2003. Um, I remember when the term Rick became like this thing, how dare you come here and ignore the theory of cultural realism. <laughs> and now I'll tell you, we're talking about how like, Nordic Nord is like this branded term used by Americans to want their lives to sound cool and edgy. And I think so we're kind of seeing like really amazing parallels. So, but overall, I think we're seeing a systematic trend upwards. And that's been my favorite impulse of like 20 some year olds. And, and no turning point to you. Yeah. Well, yes, there are like local minimum. Okay, yeah, yeah. okay my my is an issue. There are like local local minimums and stuff like that. Like maybe sometime between ten years ago was maybe when the RPGs finally became like less like the turf war got less intense. And this whole like we <coughs> were start using Nordic warp to like brand American warps in a way that makes them sound cool and edgy and artistic. Probably the last few years less. I just want to say for the record that, like, we, as a region, all the Nordic countries together have 20 million people. It's not cultural imperialism. Yeah. If we make something and you like it, that's not how that imperialism works. Completely agree about But yes. <laughs> yeah. Should I do one? Yeah. Uh, so I want to. Uh, um, one thing that, that the one turning point that I like to mention is the uh, release of Trivial Pursuit. In the, I think '84 or something like that, it became big. I think globally in '85, because it, it, it only it dawned on me just a few years ago. And I was reading up on the history of board games or the history of gaming in Sweden. That I mean, we've been talking a lot about this idea in our design community about the ludic generation. That mm -hmm. that there are so many kinds of gaming that happen at the start at the same time. Like that, it's it is not a coincidence that 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 tabletop role playing and computer gaming start at the same time. And of course, we also know that a lot of the developers of computer games were, were tabletop players. And that was true until this millennium, basically. Now, I, I think maybe not as much. Uh, 
same degree as those that have developed hand in hand all, all along those forms. But because we're in the sort of geekier end of that pool, we, we like to kind of think of OAS as a sort of special case and ostracize them. It makes us blind to the fact of how enormously popular these game, games were and how different that is, because we've always had it, but like historically that has not been the case. So, so I, and also like maybe we overestimate how marginalized we ever were, because I always use the example of E.T. You remember a movie called E.T., it's by Spielberg, it's very good, it's also from A5. Yeah, what Elliot the kid is doing, the reason he goes up... 82. 82, because because sorry, that's my initials. That's my initials. Of course, born yes, that of year. course, that's 82. Oh. The, the reason he goes into... <laughs> <laughs> Elliot goes into the yard. Sorry, Bill. And now if we're going to Elliot, so the first and last letter, yeah. his name, also not a coincidence. Elliot goes into the yard, uh, and, and he's there because his older brother doesn't let him play the Indian. They, they are in this very mainstream movie, these kids who are about to be the heroes of the story are playing, are playing tabletop role games, and that is something that he aspires to and isn't allowed to, so he has this other adventure instead, basically. But also Trivial Pursuit comes out then, and we start to have these mass market games for grown-ups mm -hmm. to play socially that really didn't exist in the way before and have existed ever since, whether it's Pictionary or Dance Maths or any of that stuff. And, and maybe we're not as weird as we like to thought, think we were. Uh, so that's one thing, uh, that's a big turning point for me. Uh, the, and then maybe from a discourse perspective, it's even so that we, as a, like a gamer communities, have invested quite a lot of effort in keeping ourselves separate from the mainstream gaming. And we've been like, oh no, like, that doesn't count. And, and that maybe we've been absolutely working against our long-term interests with that. Um, and, but then I, of course, also have to, to mention that, that in the design tradition that I'm from, which is like broadly speaking Nordic art, uh, by which we mean the art house in the Nordic art, um, we started a conference uh, in 1997 in Norway. Somebody wanted to organize a conference for Norwegian markers, uh, and internet had just become a thing mm -hmm. in the Nordic countries. Internet penetration was very rapid and very high in Nordic countries for all kinds of structural reasons. So they could find each other, all the local Norwegian communities. And when they went online to look for this, they were like, oh, there's even be some lovers in Sweden also. Mm -hmm. Maybe also some Finns, that's also invite them. And they invited each other, and people started to talk to each other. Uh, and I've been going since 1998, uh, every year, so I've been able to follow this discourse. And I think that it has been similar to the Forge in that as we are talking about design, we are both developing tools and becoming better at the craft, but we are also at the same time doing the storytelling about what we are doing as we are doing the thing. And we're creating these communities and we have to have a lot of invested emotions in them and, and so on. But it doesn't change the fact that we are, that like somehow the practice of developing and identifying the design language in itself is also a storytelling exercise about communities and ideologies. And that has, happened in the Nordic countries exactly the same way as I think it happened uh, before, which by the way, of course, we also read uh, and like, roll our eyes at <laughs> everything <laughs> one. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's yeah, but, yeah. Uh, that's, uh, and that has become a conversation that sucked into it, freeform design it became part of, of Nordic art in the Nordic countries. Because the distinction in the end wasn't about what kind of art you play, it's about are you designing in a tradition, or are you, uh, do you have a design focus? Or when you're making a, a, a game, are you doing, are you designing the spoke system for a specific purpose, or are you iterating on a tradition? Mm -hmm. And that's the distinction between the art house community of Nordic art that I belong to, which is completely design focused, and the sort of, hey, let's play another fantasy game. So it's not genre divisions at all, it's about how you approach the design process. Okay, so then I have a, a second, uh, a, a, a second question that, that has, has two prongs. One is a yes/no answer, and the other one is, of course, the uh, the the echo response. So I want you, as the panel, to think about um, in 19, I think it's 71. Richard Duke published uh, the, the the book uh, "Gaming: The Future's Language," mm -hmm. and I'm interested to know, you know, are we now in 2018 with role-playing games speaking the future's language? Yes or no? Um, and, and, and you can, you can, of course, explain why you answered the way you did. Um, again, this idea of, of like a discourse that somehow is pointing uh, to the future rather than to the past or to the present. 
And then the other uh, prong of that is, is there a field or a section of the discourse, and we're already kind of approaching that with uh, Meg mentioning uh, the Hoyle's card games, or, 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 or you mentioning Trivial Pursuit, where are there, is there some corner of knowledge or discipline of knowledge that, that will help shine a light on uh, past and present role-playing conversations that maybe we don't know. I mean, I'm also thinking of, of Vincent years ago went to a horror convention and uh, had a number of insights about uh, role-playing game design from having not sold hardly any games at all at, the, at this horror uh, film convention. And, and I'm thinking that the, the role-playing game discourse always advances when other things come in that are not role-playing games. So, you know, a, a corollary is what what are we ignoring, um, or, or you wish that would be a, a little bit more a part of what, we're, sort of what we should be discussing? So again, is gaming the future's language, and is it, and where, where are the dark corners that we aren't uh, concerned? Yeah, Vincent. I would do two claim the future. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Like, what business do we have saying we we are speaking in the language of the future? So, so my answer is no. <coughs> okay, great. Um, and I think we barely consider the history of games. Um, okay, but but that's not what I want to talk about. I don't want to talk about history. <laughs> what I want to talk about. Is um, uh, is um, a number of things that to me are obviously games that we don't consider to be games. Mm -hmm. um, uh, tricks and cons, and uh, often sports. Like we don't consider sports to be games, even though they're obviously games. Um, we don't consider gambling to be games. Like <coughs> self -help we, books. Self -help, self help books. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, you know, I had an argument with somebody on the internet one time who was <laughs> like, if games can actually make a difference, they would be uh, legislative, right? And I'm like, which they are. Yeah. Like, gambling, <coughs> the lotto is this terrible, terrible game that we as a society have accepted. Um, that's what I want to look at. Great. Um, all right, so I have never heard of this book before, the game that teaches language. So there you go. It came out the year I was born. Okay. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I kind of agree and kind of disagree with this one. Um, on one hand, yeah, like we don't have language in the future. That's going to be like language changes. You know, looking at the language that kids use. I mean, like, College kids that you're around use, like there's, and even stuff like we were talking about Twitch, which like language changes. We don't know the future, but it's so fast that sometimes we can see the iteration, sometimes we can see it coming. On the other hand, if we take just the title, gaming the language of the future, and answer that as a yes or no question, I think the answer is absolutely yes, because as we look more and more to how do we interpret our world in a place and space where um, the things that used to support our culture in a, a like a, um, uh, a bureaucratic, by which I may mean a support network that held everything in relation to, its, to each other way, um, i.e. religion or a monarchy or a, a like habitually systemically militarized society, those are mostly gone. And we are trying to find ways to reinterpret how we connect to each other, how we build communication and networks and systems, and how we uh, claw back fun and playfulness and space and uh, introspection and analyzing difficult feelings in ways that the things I mentioned 
supported prior generations, I think games are in the future. Games are how we make money in STEM, um, how we talk about difficult emotions in therapy. Okay, let's go play a difficult scenario you have with your boss in your first job. Or if you do that. Or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, how we educate kids. Let's pretend we're crossing a dangerous intersection and here it is in the classroom. How would we do the same thing? Yeah. So while we can't know the actual language for the future, um, recognizing the games pervasively completely are are the now at least. Yeah, so I've, I've been thinking about this question, right? I mean, since you let me in, and Evan has a leg up on this, right? Because he's read this book, and so he knows what yeah. this guy's argument is, and we don't. Right? So we're just guessing at what he might possibly be trying to argue, right? By like calling gaming the future's language, right? Which means, okay, from 1971, what does the future look like? Okay, well, you know, 1974, D&D gets published, and then video games uh, uh, emerge, crash, emerge again. Come, you know, come rise to it's like coming back stronger. So, from the, so the, 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 the subject of the question, right, is okay, is how we engage with games now different from how we engage with games then? Somebody said, was it Vinny? Yes, 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 for you, how would you say it? Yes, yes, for you, right? Said, or maybe, or maybe it was Espinosa, somebody scanned me. That's right. Anyway, um, right, who said, right, uh, the history of games is always being lost in this. Maybe just always be lost, right? The idea that we, we the history of games is something that we that we lose all the time, right? And so, so but just looking from the perspective of um, right now um, and thinking about okay, are, are we engaging with games differently? I want to mention like two books, like the sort of bookend this one different ways in which okay, maybe the answer is yes, right? Which is uh, first, McGonagall's uh, reality is broken, right? Where she argues that gamers are going to save the future. This, right? Because gaming inculcates mindsets that will um, solve problems and, and address really, really important things. Uh, Yule's book, uh, the a Casual Revolution, uh, talks about the pervasiveness of games and not not the way that McGonagall was talking about it, right? In terms of hardcore gaming, people identify as gamers, but just in terms of the pervasiveness of play um, in different in different uh, uh, media and different forms in front of us, and so. Um, to the extent that that leads in that, that looking at these you know, two books sort of in juxtaposition makes you think about something like gamification, right? The idea that that the tools of games and gaming are getting incorporated and get used as I don't know for for selling things and building relationships between consumers and corporations and between employees and employers, um, you know, sort of suggests that well, um, if it's not the language of the future, it's it's a language of the future and it's dystopian, right? It's a dystopian future that we should worry about. It. So so I mean uh, so I'm gonna stop there uh, because uh, I I still need to think about this a little more. Yeah. I think that the that is the language of the future only if I get to define the future as what I thought the future would be in the nineteen nineties. <laughs> uh, and and it's like there is a, a mindset that connects to that idea of like what, how our generation approaches the world, our generation's plural approach to the world, and, and what makes these games relevant to us now than before. And of course, it has to do with, with this idea that the game start model, like uh, play, but our play theory is modeling uh, agency and power and, and freedom uh, in complex systems and dynamic systems. And back then, we would have called it a hacker mindset, this way of looking at the world as a as as this real, or we're looking at the well, now, I would say, like the reality stack as this nested system, so sort of like reprogrammable uh, code, whether or not, or not, I think there was rules, but in the 90s, there was a code. And this idea that, that whether it's like the natural laws are pretty much what they are, but above that, everything is constructed by man and can therefore be reprogrammed by man, whether it's etiquette or how we talk about pronouns or how we organize our societies or how we how we implement social change. And all those things are of course systems and and the, the and they are increasingly complex, many people would claim that our lives today are uh, increasingly complex and that, that complexity when has that accelerated our brains apparently have some kind of need 
to also engage with it in a playful way, that it becomes relaxing to us and it becomes fulfilling to us to explore um, reality through the me through media, through art, I would say, that, that uh, engages with, where, where we engage with the many great systems. And that's the whole point of like games. And then, of course, yes, that is the language of the future, except that the future is now, and it's already been around for a good many decades. Um, but we don't, we are not as, like, in the discourse level, we're not as aware of it. Maybe in this, these communities, we are aware of it. And that's also why we can, can manipulate reality in ways uh, with our in design skill sets that, that seem uncommon and still very alien and, and terrifying even to, to some other communities of yours that want us to work with professionally. <laughs> uh, and what should we be discussing? I don't know, but maybe that's the answer. Like, I think we should also discuss uh, the responsibilities that we have as design communities who can see the matrix, so to speak, uh, and who can understand this world and who can rebuild it uh, with the power of our minds. Uh, how much responsibility we have in, inside the games, but also uh, to and in the world uh, in general. I think when, like, the, the second part of the question, uh, in terms of what we're I need to wait a minute to think more about what you said. Mm -hmm. um, I, would, I, I would, I guess, talk about the past versus the future because talk about the past. Um, also, I should mention that I am unfamiliar with this work. Um, I was not born yet, and I'm not that it stops you from reading it, but um, I answer my Wikipedia, and then again, I guess, you know what this work is. But in terms of like past work scholarship, um, my question is, so, so um, I work well on this Norwegian war point scholar. It has this like ongoing, continuously updated lecture on like what is war, but it strikes me as like one of the most difficult topics to ever track because apparently he, in this process of trying to track war, he um, went through some amount of forgotten texts and traced war back to like some 19th century, times of the theater, yes. that, that. Um, and that. Uh, and there are other attempts. Apparently, like, here this here this weekend, we heard. How do you know whether Wallace well, was, was a work, was technically a work designer, which is an interesting idea. Um, so I think I think it goes on this. this so way. Um, well, as a person who wrote the theater, the press. I, I, I have no stake in this argument, but um, just saying. But it is it is being said. So this um, idea of large scholarship in the past is kind of um, th there's a trigger history in the past, which isn't always continuous. Um, but also, I, I would also argue that um, there's there's often a conception that there's like linear progress in terms of like every everything, technology, human progress, whatever, or and more scholarship. Um, I, or, 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 or game design or talk about games. I don't necessarily think that's necessarily true um, because conversations happen often in in, in, in isolated ecosystems and evolve separately. Um, I sense the internet was the great flat day of it, and I'm sure those of you who are on the floor chat saw that. But even then, there's like geographical differences, um, minor, bigger differences. Um, I sense that one change that might come out in the future is the flattening of languages, because um, poking around Europe, traveling, and meeting gamers and workers in like Europe, like, I sense that Europe is like this potential powder keg. Uh, I also part of tech as a trigger term in Europe. It's it's just potential. Um, it has there's this potential like a system of like more traditions and game design conversations that are separated by a language barrier. Um, like I just have this impending sixth sense that there's like the, that France and Belgium have their own separate tradition that evolves separately, and maybe in the near future, maybe as translation programs get better in Europe, or something like that, there might be some potential there or translators get together or the world gets flatter because the internet connects communities who have come together with this language barrier. And also the context of games change as games themselves change due to trends like technology. Um, like, um, I was, like young, really young people right now are changing our lot through things like technology, like warps, the idea that you can digitize things and do things over the internet, like, and, and still have a real person warp with all the all the trappings that are aware that are assisted by technology is rapidly changing the nature of the discourse. Um, and things are going to continue as well. I think the role playing games, the idea that they themselves are now, are now assisted by technology, or board games for this matter, um, like, are now, like, now that board games can be 
do require smartphones is something that's unprecedented. So the nature of the smart smart have to also respond to these trends as well as my impression. Um, do, you, do you want to return to your? No, I, I, no but I, I do want to get the second half of the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Moderator says, says uh, uh, both tag on him and say your point. Oh. Keep it. Okay. I don't know. But I'll try. Anyway, uh, maybe I'll just do this random thing where I make a point and then I answer the second question. Great. Okay, cool. So, point. Um, you mentioned uh, pervasiveness of play. And what you just said about like having like, your smartphone is a part of playing board game. I mean, you didn't say that. Oh, well, yeah. Okay. Well, I did. So, yeah. <laughs> um, the pervasiveness of play that that brings in, like, as a casual game, like, there's gaming everywhere, and, everything. and I, I think that that may not be true. I think it's a pervasiveness of busyness and a pervasiveness of, of participation in false um, productivity. Um, that we have been, like, gaming is everywhere, it's how we're trying to deal with it, but also we are being absolutely marketing to not stop um, through this gamification and other things like that. So we wind up in a place where um, you know, that uh, pervasiveness of busyness is as a false productivity based on capitalism, capitalization, uh, and of consumptive patterns, where you know, on our phone, oh, this is fun. Oh, this is a fun game. Mm, buy this new fun game. Mm, buy this new fun game. Mm, because we are not actually getting some kind of gratifying experience of play out of that. Um, it is not actually hooking into the things that are where a gratifying experience of play happens, which is an a, a intersection of um, does it have personal context for my life in some way? Does it connect me in, to other people? Do I have a meaningful goal of any kind in the, in in this play? Um, and is there some is there some mind body integration process of what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, how this how this, there's there's something there, and that leads to where I think um, places that we're missing in game design, in large game design, in tabletop. Um, and for God's sake, in digital game design, is um, playground games, is physical games, is the 1970s, the new games, <coughs> of the new games thing. And it blends right into another thing which we're dealing with, which are, I think, the like, desire to, oh my God, have games to connect us again, because, because physicality is falling out the way. And I, God, I love consent. You know, consent is awesome. And the thing like, oh, can you go home? Yes, hell yes, a thousand times yes. But can we please just play the rover? You know, can we just like let's all let's play elbow tag, where we care up like this and we run around the room. And we're like, oh, okay, Richard. All right, now we're gonna make up with you. You know, okay, come on. Like this tiny bit of casual physical connection matters, and it makes a difference to our play. And it's why live action role playing, where you are. In body, you are actually in your body doing a thing that has meaning in some way. When we are moving, even if we're rocks, like I played Still Not Life last night. Oh, oh, loved it. Anyway, um, where um, that's where I feel like Barb is catching into that little bit of physical mind body experience connection integration that is necessary. And with tabletop role playing uh, and games, we have some similar experience with that, even if it's just like, okay, uh, we have pencils, we have paper, we have dice, we have some physical way, we have physical changes on our character sheets or on the game of ephemera that we can see a tactile physical difference. And if we're playing on online and it's great, there's Twitch apps and things, there, that gets removed a little, but it's still, you know, all right, there's, Buttons I gotta push, like 
All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw a card now. Cool. It's, I personally, I'm both incredibly fascinated with that and like aware of the move that puts. And so this is where the flattening of the earth winds up coming into like a very strange space. Because on one hand, hell yes, you know, I'm never have been enough time. And I really want to figure out how to do like the Twitch streaming. It begins with a D, what's the other one? Discord. Discord. Yeah. I want to do all that. I want to get up all in that mess. But please, nom, nom, nom. But it's also like, how do we, how do we keep doing this, you know? Because this is magic, and we are primates. We are little, we are little mammal primates, and we have gone through a place where our own evolution, like our 12-year-old, doesn't remember before touch screens. Who in this room remembers before touch screens? Okay, great. Do you know we're one of the last? Like we're on the edge. You know, in another couple, of, in another couple of years, we ask that question, are uh, people will not be able to raise their hands? And so this is the part where the language of the future, you know, it is a steam roller, and we are not, um, we're, not we're not prepared in terms of our, our, our like psychological, physiological, uh, ecological, environment, like, uh, evolutionary existence, we still have these needs to like, I want to see, I want to, I want to smell. There's all people in this room, you know, I want to have that experience. And you may be, everybody is on this like incredible spectrum of where their comfort zone is. And I so love and respect that everybody found that in this space when they said, please move closer. And you did as you were comfortable. So it's not that everybody has to be nonstop, like doing all the things all the time, but like that part of where what we're missing is remembering tabletop, like before tabletop games, playground games. And I want to do tracks of games like this, which is, this is the playground track. And we're going to play Red Rover, and we're going to play Mother Maya, and we're going to play these amazing, these bizarre games that these teenage girls in the open are playing. And this also connects to a thing of accessibility, where designing for, like, can everybody play this game? You know, I'm like, I have a game we can play. It takes a rock. Okay, um, at, at this point, uh, I've got one direct question that directly addresses the, the panel, and, and, and you, can, you can state things very simply, and then we'll just take, we'll take more questions and comments. Uh, the direct question is, what was the thing that you've created or done to intervene in role-playing discourse? And you know, you know, it doesn't have to have had a huge impact, but what was the thing that you you know put out in the world because you, you felt that there was a lack or a problem or a, or a thing you wanted to address? Well, I wrote a game called Nakata. Yes, you did. And um, the thing that it does that I really like is it um, uses a deck of tower-like cards uh, as kind of oracle, uh, and and that drives play. And so my game design, thinking about different ways of doing that, of the combining the random appearance of symbols and the human ability to make meaning out of symbols. Um, I think it's a really powerful design space that I want to continue to explore. And uh, I know, um, I'll just say this thing, like um, when I first like wrote this game and start, started uh, playtesting it, um, people had a tough time with the interpretation of the cards, you know, using that to create situation and Resolve actions, which is what I wanted to do, um, until uh, In a Wicked Age came out, right? Which is a game that also uses oracles. And so, as, so as people began uh, becoming more familiar with the notion that oh, you can sort of read the meanings of the card in order to create things and introduce them into the fiction, it became easier to sort of use that. And so I see that as a as an intervention of sorts, right? Like sort of a because it's a it's a different way of using that tool. So I'm quite proud of that. 
I'm thinking about where this where the video goes because I want to talk about something that hasn't happened yet. Oh, the future. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I've been uh, I've had the privilege of teaching at the Larp Rider Summer School for five years, and uh, and we I was therefore also part of formalizing that curriculum uh, where we took the design a lot of the design knowledge in the Nordic tradition uh, and made it something that we can teach people with literally almost zero LARP experience over five days. And uh, we've had 250 students through, about half of them are from Belarus. This is funded by the Norwegian Foreign Ministry as a way of uh, smuggling democracy skills uh, into this dictatorship. Um, but the other half of our, of our students are from everywhere else uh, in the world and um, in Europe. And, uh, and the tragedy of that has always been that that if you are already a large designer, you don't get to go. Mm -hmm. uh, then you're overqualified, and we need, and we also because of like teaching business, we need the, 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 the groups to be approximately on the same level. This is really bugging me, and we're very, very, very close uh, to releasing something that's quite secret, and I'm telling you now anyway. Uh, the something that I'm <laughs> we're currently calling the large design good camp, which we take. Uh, groups of people who are already art designers and put them through a seven day process where they do the full curriculum of the summer school to give them a common language and then we put them through a three day <coughs> summer school to come out with a prototype or a label game at the other end. And, uh, and I want to commit to doing like my vision, or my, this comes from like a strategic analysis of where we are because in Europe you are absolutely right, Ross, about all of these different communities starting to talk uh, about each other with each other, and I can see that what, what I witnessed in the Nordic countries 20 years ago has sort of a very difficult process of, of gaining that common language, uh, where you go backwards as much as forwards because people go to each other's things, and then they misunderstand what they have just played and experienced, and then they go home and recreate it, that is, invent something completely different, they call it the same thing, they call it, you know, well, like, or what we've been seeing here with like Nordic art in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> which has very little to do with anything I know, but like they're great, but it's just not, it's very different. Um, and I don't think it's useful. I think we are wasting a lot of years because the future is in fact a steamroller and I want to hack that. And I have run the scenarios in my mind and I think if we commit to running the bootcamp for five years so that we can get 500 large designers through, it's going to be pretty much everybody in Europe who does things on a high enough level that them having the same language will make a big difference. And then we're going to come out with that 300 games and all of those people can affect their local communities. And then I think you know, with a relatively small effort we could make a massive strategic impact in, in how these large design traditions can affect the world. And this is like, I mean it sounds like a big thing but actually it's not like super, this is not an impossibly difficult thing to do. Like it's, it's within my power with the, the support of some well-connected uh, organizations and, and things to make this thing happen. And I kind of want to say that probably you can do that as well. Like, we can make pretty big changes in the world if we start from like some kind of strategic analysis, of like what, where are we against? And that is the difference that I see between like my community and these communities. But I wonder if there is the, like the keynotes that the Norwegians that were speaking this morning, Martin and Anne, about this idea of approaching games as a community that you have responsibility for. That it's not like my games company or is my art going to be played by people. That's also important, but what, I'm, what I am invested in personally is what is the future of this form? Or what, is, what is the reach of these tools or this community? And that seems very American. <laughs> but, but I think it could be American. I think with your reach, you can make this happen. And the Forge was a way of doing that back in the day. And I think what, what, what would be the equivalent now? No? Oh, uh, well, so we have to sneak it in. Yes. Right. We have to, uh, we have to use other methods than the word organizing to dominate the conversation when it's Give time to. Give some examples. I um, would prefer not. All right. Uh, Can you just turn I'm off the camera? Because I'm talking about the pockets. Yeah, that's what I thought you were talking yes. about. Um, so where talk about it. Yes. We have to, you know, we see ways that uh, tabletop mobile games, in our case, could change, and ways that tabletop mobile game design, especially for us, could be more accessible. Mm -hmm. um, and we want new designers to succeed in creating and publishing fun and satisfying games. 
creating and publishing first games. Mm -hmm. Like you learn, you learn more in the in the two weeks after you've published your game than you did in the five years leading up to that. Mm -hmm. um, and but but you can't. It's un-American. It's it's not done for us to organize that. It's it's an act of social hostility for us to try to organize that. Well, yeah. It's, it's, to America. Yeah. <laughs> like we just and so we, we have to do covert acts of social hostility. We have to, we have to make a gift. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. So, 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 so I'll go ahead. I'm sorry. So I want to briefly disagree. So the apocalypse world and all the hacks and so on is part of a, I'm going to call it a rich tradition in America of basically making, of collaboratively making stuff available for free. I mean, it's, it's the Creative Commons, it's the open source. It's, I mean, it is a part of that tradition. And yes, it's not the mainstream tradition, uh, but it is increasingly becoming part of that through broader language of remix culture. Basically. Would you call it a counter tradition? Yeah, I mean, obviously it's not the same, like it's in, in opposition to you know, sort of regular mainstream liberal capitalism. I would agree with specific sure, attention sure. to the language that's used about organizing. Yeah. It's important. Like, Vince and I come up to a lot of things through. A, like a literal, actual organizing for social change through the labor movement and through American history and where that needs to be done and how that was done. To to you know, that's part of our game design, you know. Um, so you're not wrong, but like the language you know, is really specific and rigid. Right, right. Like I agree with you. Like we weren't, uh, you know, saying use this. This is available. Please use it. Um, that's not where we. Uh, that that was not our supposed to act, right? That that's a strong counter. Like that exists. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Um, the the subversive act was here are design tools that are better than the design tools you have. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Which is also the heart of open source software. Well, but certainly. The Trojan horse of open source software is make it available, with six classes on it, then forces other stuff to be available. And if that software is really, really good, it gets used, then you sort of cracked open the nut of, oh my god, now, like, the server software needs to be open source because they're using this kernel up here and there. And that's sort of the fight of that community. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting. It's sort of police mm -hmm. and basically, like, hey, 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 your thing is super cool, but you use this bit of our software, it's nice, and then you open up, and you have blow-ups, and you have to open up. Yeah, so we didn't do that at all. Mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, we haven't released, like, our, we don't have an open source license on our uh, uh, we, um, we consider copyright law to be sufficient. You don't need a license to publish a popular world in order to publish monster rights. Uh, and so, uh, and, and we don't need, we, Meg and I, don't need monster rights to be open in the way that a popular world is. Like, I consider Apocalypse World to have done the damage, right? <laughs> Anybody can now come and do that. And if if um, Adam said to make Dungeon World open source, like uh, uh, Creative Commons, that's fantastic. But that's sort of, yeah, yeah that's, 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 that's their choice, right? Well, um, like in a way, the mission for me is to take play, play game culture, and, and, and especially in the United States, where it becomes so obvious when we're running this here that, that, that I want. And it sounds like so arrogant almost, but, but I, I want to liberate people from like a consumer paradigm to a design paradigm. Uh -huh. and, and that's the mission, like that's what we want to do. And so if Ross runs like a con of these quality, like amazing scenarios in Los Angeles, that's part of that mission. Like, we're all working towards the same goal. And the reason it's not wrong, like the reason this is an ethically sound thing to do is that I don't actually tell people what kinds of games they should make, and neither do you. I don't care. I mean, I care about a great deal, but I'm not going to dictate because the whole point is that this is a toolkit. It's not actually an ideology. Like we are, we are not normative in any way. We are just saying these are the design choices. Absolutely. These are the tools. Mm -hmm. Now you think about what kind of thing you want to make, and you go do that thing. Yeah. And that's yeah. it's, instead of saying this kind of game is better than that kind. No, there's good and bad design, but like there, that's not a normative. It's a systems question. I want to say internally the arrogant thing, which is that uh, Nathan and uh, Sean's thing in the keynote this morning uh, about Big Bad work, like that was always the end of our project. Like that was always what, what we were going for, uh, is um, you know, introducing 
sex ed tools essentially is, is where we drew our material when our infrastructure was introducing these social tools to uh, give people gamers. You just explicitly said that the sex ed tools are sort of the underwriting concentric circles of pocket tools and so on. Uh-huh. Is that, is that true? Would that be one No, no, no. I mean, it's just that that's an article for some, I mean, I'm just pitching that to the room. Anyone can think about I mean, that. the that's whole thing, like, if you look at Pockets of Women, it's <laughs> consent and, and communication. And when I teach sex ed classes, one of the things I need to convey to school boards and concerned parents is that 92% of what I teaching our communication skills, how to know yourself, how to know where your own boundaries are, how to respect the boundaries of other people, and how to negotiate, communicate in ways that are safe and holistic within whatever your own center is. Um, and then there's a bit about you know, biology, and then there's a bit about like, you know, a bit about the camps and like SDGs. Like the huge part of that is, is communication. And that's what he established at the beginning of this. We talk about a, a, a discourse that that's what this is. He's talking together, finding ways to communicate. And so, yeah, the sex ed, the, the sex ed games that I grew up with and that I was uh, designed for different things in different places. And then we see them coming back to us in a way that, like, it's bringing it up here again. That was like the fulfillment of my every hope as a game designer to see tools that I inspired being used to create actual demonstrative immediate improvement to people's ability to connect and communicate with other people. I want to know what most this thing is, but that was my question. Can we force this thing? Wait, it's my thing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. How would you intervene? What, what's been your intervention? Oh, are you, well, this is where I talk about my cozy. Yes, it is your, where you talk about cozy. Okay. Um, yeah, so I live in the part of the United States that's kind of like a dwarf desert. I mean, it's not quite correct, and Southern California, the buffalo scene is very, very vibrant, but anything other than that is kind of um, not happening because design, black hat or whatever. So we had. To well, we want to sell like people work just to like get people think about what works are there, to understand that work is actually something that's really awesome, and we should do it, and we should do it, but it was to a hostile audience potentially, and it's kind of like weird. it's L.A. where we make movie, movies and stuff like that. Why can't we do work there? <laughs> so like, um, and so I tried, I tried like like I actually tried to do previous initiatives. There's a free farm regular thing that I use with personalities. Um, so you, I think if you're asking for things about things that are new and cool, I would actually argue that Cozy is actually really time-tested strategies that we just borrowed from us where we brought to LA. Um, so one insight that came from Charles Wilson, like my co-runner Betty and I visited him in Denmark, and he actually flat out to us, like, the art itself is not the event itself has to be something that's not really interesting, but like almost at hardly more important is just having an event where people come and think. So come and speak. So like um, the United States has a lot of works all over the place that are run very, very differently and there's no real things. And tradition, if you go to Intercon, like it's great work, I love Intercon, I go back every year. But it's it's really a place to play LARP, it's not really meaningful. So like all we get up in meeting people say, Hey, I played a LARP with you, what, what's your name? So great work, but that is a problem. So we a, so we um, problem two is that LA is expensive. That's okay. We went to the Airbnb, and I think we borrowed elements from a lot of like more events we liked. Um, a lot of, so the European art festivals are often very less ambitious. Like like three or four events over the entire weekend is a lot. So we had a few events, we spaced them out, had a lot of time in between so people would come. Um, we did other social engineering techniques to make it very successful. We were like, Warp is fun, it's cool, you should do this, it's a little cost. 
low barrier to entry, and we chose a large that we thought we that we all played were enjoyable. Someone else has already played them, so for now, this is new, new works. They need to not suck because, and they need to be friendly to new newcomers. And we just became their entire network, and people came. Um, and we we and because we we chose a very international work scene, we, we exposed people to as many different works as possible. But there was one other work in the cards, which was great because it was a high school work and every and it was stupidly easy. And everyone has had experience with high school draw from, and that and that was easy. We brought in Belarusian works. The Belarusian is like a lot of like I know like most of our contacts in the summer school, which is where a lot of these contacts were made. Like the Belarusians were overjoyed that a work was being run in, in LA. Like the, and, and it brought a very unique take because the Belarusian life experience is very different from that of Sunny Um and uh, and a bunch of other times we really liked. So. And that was our attempt to sell the idea of LARP. And there are people who love LARP. There are also a lot of people who didn't LARP, but we kind of finished to come. And there was, there's an immersive theater event built, theater movement going on. And Ellie's actually kind of of this. Like, what our big thing is, how do we kind of convince them that LARP is like a mess? Right. How, how, how do we keep making one of us? OK. So that was the thing. It was, everything was done already. That was, that was the thing. <laughs> Your, your question and then question. We got about ten minutes. Would it, would it, would it not be possible to be quite transparent about the mission? Like, I mean, it's not a secret. I mean, I, I'm so I, I don't want to write like a strategy paper analyzing the situation in Europe because people are going to get pissy about it. But you know, because then you have to defend the language yeah, and all that stuff. But like, but I don't think it, 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 it's. The part that is like, I think it would be helpful if all of us have, uh, if we have access to the same time, you don't have to come, like, people will pay to participate in this thing. If they don't want to come, they'll sign up, and it's like, that's, that doesn't take anything away from anybody, you know? So, so it feels like it's not, it doesn't feel weird to say, I think it would be cool if we met and talked about art. And in a way, you know, you also lure them there with like nice atmosphere and games, but once they're there, right, in particular, you can be like, hey, and also the talking part, that was actually also intentional. Much like, like here we are completely transparent about the social design of this event. And I think that's, you think that work? Which part? Because I can tell you that being really transparent about uh, designing from a sex ed background uh, is like catastrophically Undo in the states. I realize that. But if I would just, uh, but the, the part about wanting to make design better design tools or design tools available. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Hmm. Horrible. Uh, like, it's pretty obvious that that's what it is, right? So, yeah, yeah. I mean, we've got a ton of pushback on it. And a teacher yeah. to design in a way that's better than any other way to design. Yeah. Like, that comes across. <laughs> Play this instrument, and if you don't like it, you can go back to the trumpet. Like I, <laughs> I super love that. So, like, here's here's an issue for me, right? Like, one of the things that we run into this is, um, like you mentioned earlier, like the, there's a difference in perspective, you know, uh, and a difference in approach. And in some places, it's like it's a big deal. It's just a different difference in approach. But sometimes it feels like talking about LARP and even talking about LARP and tabletop is like, no, yeah. no. Yeah. You know, like I'm coming up at the beginning of Vampire Art, right? Vampire Mass Grave, which is you know, the Essence Society of Grave and Activism. And then uh, Vampire Mass Grave is happening, and nothing. And then it's like, whoa, no. You know, and so there's a lot of space for me personally of like, I don't know what the LARP is that means this thing. And, mm, you know, and it took me a while to like get the doing the exact same damn thing for the same reasons and it's awesome and I'm like, what do I get to do over here? I had the same experience, Meg. Yeah. I, was, I was in a vampire campaign LARP for two years, thought yeah. this is, this experience is utter crap and quit LARP for, for uh, yeah, 15 years. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, at least seven years or so and, and then uh, we discovered it at Fostival and I'm like, oh, these people are actually doing the kind of play I wanted to do back in 2002, I, I, I couldn't do. Yeah, well, and then I've been doing it then I've gone But like, so the, but the issue is, so right now, like even even with LARP and LARP and Tabletop, and then you have the various branching issues within both those scenes, it's a little bit like saying, okay, there's football and golf and tennis and they all involve a ball. 
so you should all just be really good friends and support each other's stuff. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Maybe not. I mean, yes, sports is cool. Let's have a sports bar. But, like, we're golf. <laughs> so, the Tuesday afternoon at the sports bar is the golf. You know, there's tea, there's little cucumber sandwiches, and there's like quiet jazz. You know? And Monday night football at the sports bar is a totally different scene. And then the times when we're like, okay, and then we'll do like the midnight curling. We just watch curling live, and that's like total rock star scene and car curling and karaoke, right? Um, whatever. But you see how it comes to like that's that's one of the things that I'm like. How the heck do we get all these things to play together in a way that's recognizing your fun is awesome? Rock on about your tennis game. The six so, minutes, Jose. So why do we have to reconcile in the first place? Oh, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not even saying this to I'm saying this is a thing that exists. Um, it might be useful. I heard a couple of Yeah, it's a um, When I went to Boston and I started talking, doing you know, very basic economic analysis of what I was seeing going on in Boston as a, as a scene, um, I got enormous pushback. Like to even have mentioned it, to even say, hey, have you noticed who's paying me? You know, people were like, well, and, and in the U.S. I can say, hey, do you notice who's paying who in this situation? And everybody says, oh, yeah, we do. We, and then we can have that conversation, and we could not have that conversation at Boston. That was, that was it, it was actually very rude. I didn't know, but it was actually very rude for me to bring that up. Pretty <laughs> <laughs> um, And here for me to say, hey, I have a social plan. I have, I have a vision for how people should treat each other. Um, is that same kind of group, is a similar kind of group, like that's something we don't talk about. Something I, I, I'm not allowed to do that kind of analysis. I'm not allowed to say that I have done that kind of analysis. I'm not allowed to uh, invite other people to do that kind of analysis. And one of the reasons we have is we're going to do the um, history of the United States. Look how we, we have a live under this pervasive lie that we all have to agree to go along with in order for our society to survive the next hour. You know? And it's a terrible shame that we live with, crushing terrible guilt. <laughs> like, and, and Which is? So I can't even, you know, which is the system of extractive oppression that we live? Genocide. Like, we and live on stolen land, we yeah. live uh, you can't in, say in the. It would be really nice if someone didn't shoot me at school here. Yes, they're not getting people sending you death threats. Right, right. And we have to, and we have to deny completely or conveniently forget that the, United, the original 13 United States came from vastly, dramatically different socioeconomic, political. Um, like places, and that, that contributes to the way we educate our children, the way we um, negotiate our health care, the way we deal with our justice system, and the, the, that because of the original state by state, incredible differences that existed, um, we have this ridiculously bizarre, bizarre place, which if you are, are dealing with this, this is how it's made, you know, long enough worked out some of that crap, you know, because it's not like the, the Nordic Scandinavian countries didn't have some of that. Like we can talk about yeah. Sami. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's not like it has all gone away, but there's at least a little bit of more time for things to sort of try to figure out. But there's, there's something about systems change, though, like you don't have to, like you don't have to convince everybody in a way, like because the, the other way, you only have to convince like the nodes that will have the maximum impact relative to what we can do in some other so, like, right. so, 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 so oh. what is the equivalent, uh, maybe? Like if I if I think that there are 500 people in Europe who would who could change the world, who could change the art world, that's all I need with with better design skills. Like what is the equivalent of that part? That might be possible. Right. And so like then we can then we come into my place of like yeah, but they all have healthcare. You know, and when we're when we're looking at a place in America where you have people who 
are holding down with three shitty part time jobs. Sure, sure, so they can, I mean, and that's also, again, that is a, an ignorant statement. Remember, because there are people struggling in every country. But, you know, something that you see just like, my kids have grown up for 21 years in a country that's out of war. You know, our second son just turned 18. And thank God he's not going to college right away. So he doesn't have to sign up for the draft under this current administration. Yeah. Ben? Hi, Ben. Hey. Can you just be an up note, please? Well, so <laughs> in the midst of all of that, I've taken some notes, and I'm, I'm curious and loving the engagement. And I have uh, an idea that bubbled up in me that I, I'm sure someone has had before. Um, and, and that is the creation of a pattern language of LARP. Um, uh, and I'm wondering, uh, is that been documented somewhere? Is that what you're talking about with your, your um, summer school? Uh, uh, where is that? How do, we, how do we continue to develop? Because this, this seems to me like an essential piece of discourse about design is pattern language. Uh, uh, Jane Lee and Jason Morningstar put out a PDF called Logic Patterns. Cool. There you Thanks. Go. Yep, there's also the Logic Learning for the yeah, also has a lot of stuff. And the way the wiki is a wealth of information too. What's a pattern language? A pattern language. The the first book published under that title um, was a book by a bunch of architects about patterns in architecture, um, and they say a pattern language because they don't want to claim that it's the only pattern language for this set of patterns. And in fact, they suggest this as a design. Uh, Metaphor for for a uh, a so way of talk, talk a way of talking design. about um, about design patterns in general. Okay. And the the book goes from massive scale uh, like regional design all the way down to um, secret hiding places for your treasured things uh, inside of it. So it's commonly referring solutions to specific problems. Yeah. Um, actually, which one's that's one of the first architects in America um, doing this sort of strategic analysis of the architecture. So for architecture, Chris Ferdinand Alexander would be the, the, the name, the entrance to that article. And, and also I was thinking Simon's uh, uh, the, the Science of the Artificial, or I remember what it is, the language of the artificial, Herbert Simon. We're at 6.15. And, and, and so we've arrived at the end of our panel. Please give, give everyone a round of applause.